All right. There we go. We are live with the great and powerful Dr. Pat Davidson, the man who kicked off this entire podcast, by the way. You were episode number one. And uh, I don't know what episode number we're on now, 100 something. So I am I'm pumped to have you back on the show, man. Man, that's, uh, wow, I have to live up to myself. That's tough. Yeah. That was a fun one. Uh, I mean, God, I was in grad school still at that time. Um, but yeah, I remember that was a very good conversation. I remember talking about the concept of phase change. And I think that was something that you were super into at that time. But let's do this. If, if somebody listening happens to have no idea who you are, which is probably pretty unlikely because I think we share like a pretty big overlap of audience. But if someone listening has no idea who you are, can you give them just a quick elevator pitch and then we can just dump in and just talk training? Yeah. Um, it's funny. It's like sometimes people ask me like, oh, so what do you do for a living? I'm like, I don't really even know anymore. Uh, I, I sell fitness shit online. Um, but I, uh, I have a PhD in exercise physiology, a master's degree in strength and conditioning. I've worked as a professor. I've worked in, um, you know, I, I coached uh, strength athletes while I was at Springfield College. I was building a strength and conditioning program at Brooklyn College when I was there. Uh, I ultimately kind of moved into the private sector in, in Manhattan of personal training. I did that for seven years. Uh, during that time, I wrote uh, three books, two of which are on Rebel Performance, Mass and Mass 2. Um, the third one was the uh, Coach's Guide to Optimizing Movement, which was a, a three-year project for me to write that thing. And it also overlaps with the uh, Rethinking the Big Patterns certification seminar series that I developed and, and you know, started teaching this year in January, um, which is the overall training model that I utilize from a theoretical conceptual standpoint that, that builds a framework for understanding trainable human movement, how to define it, organize it, and uh, ultimately pull it apart from the perspective of specificity so that you can really begin to have a much better conceptual understanding of how to plug the right drills in for anyone that you're working with from a needs analysis perspective. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've also just always tried to be a uh, live it kind of a person. You know, I've competed in sports as much as I can my whole life, baseball and football as a kid. Uh, after uh, a, a short college baseball stint, I got into um, jujitsu and mixed martial arts. And eventually, when I was a professor at Springfield College, I got into strongman, and I competed with the guys and, and girls that I coached at Springfield College. And uh, we have a pretty good track record of, of competitors that came out of that Springfield College Team Iron Sports group, with um, you know the most prominent of which is Rob Kearney. Um, and the Hatch brothers are, are kind of right there as well with really like some, some elite international competitors in that sport. And so I would just say that I, I'm probably someone that is, uh, you know, academic plus in the trenches and, and one of the early people in this, you know, probably newer, more evolved uh, coach model where you kind of have a pretty good sense of uh, all of the major training modalities that are classic in terms of typical weight room kinds of things, Olympic lifts, powerlifting kind of movements, bodybuilding stuff, but then also this, this um, biomechanics lens that, you know, probably got pulled more from the PRI world than any other, certainly modified a great deal with, with guys like Hartman uh, that I think just understands it better than anybody else and, and put a spin on it that's different. Um, but I, I would just say that there's, there's probably a camp of strength and conditioning coaches or trainers that I would say are, are the most well-rounded um, in terms of being able to put it all together. And I would like to put myself in that short list of people that has a pretty damn good ability to say that I'm about as well-rounded as anybody uh, from the perspective of really getting it in terms of the holistic nature of of uh, the physics of biomechanics, the neurology of biomechanics, 
superimposed on top of like very classical understanding of performance training. Yeah, I love that. That's one of the things that, that we talk about a lot is, and I think this is kind of what we find within our, I think, small circle or sphere of influence is you, you get people that actually understand the movement and the biomechanics and can blend and mesh that really nicely with high quality, the highest quality strength conditioning an understanding of how to drive hypertrophy, an understanding of how to develop strength, an understanding of how to develop power, an understanding of how to develop endurance. And I think it's, it's very hard to find people that actually blend those things together well, right? I think you can go find someone who's an expert at just powerlifting. They're going to be very good at just getting you strong. You can find somebody who's going to be an expert at getting you on stage to compete in bodybuilding. You can find someone that's going to help you run a marathon. It's hard finding people that can pull the best from all these domains and worlds and actually understand the science and the application and have lived it in the trenches. And that's one of the things that I've always respected about you. And then the team that we build at Rebel is kind of just, those are our qualifications and requirements. You've got to be able to do that because that's what we want to deliver for our people. And I think that one place here I would love to start because I think this has been the biggest shift in your training since the last time we talked, both in your training and then I think in the coaching and the things that I'm seeing you doing heavily influenced by Derek Hans, I'm imagining, is this transition to way more, you know, the athletic weapon sprint heavy, way more sprinting in your program. And I know we have a lot of people listening. I would throw myself in that bucket who played sports their entire life. There probably wasn't a day that went by I didn't sprint until I was probably about like 22. Like when I graduated college, I sprinted every day. I just, you kind of had to for sport, right? And then your sports end and it's like, cool, I'm just going to lift now. And so you just start lifting and you're in the weight room all the time. And then a couple of years go by and then you realize, oh shit, I can't sprint anymore. Like I literally cannot sprint. If I were to go sprint right now, I would pull a hamstring, I'd blow out a quad. It would be something. I just don't, I don't have the ability to open up at that high velocity. I know we have a lot of people that find themselves there and want to work back to being able to actually open up and really sprint. So I would love to hear from you. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned kind of in that journey, both as a coach and as an athlete yourself, getting back to the point now to being able to like really sprint and let it eat? Because I think that that transition can be a hard one to get back into because people have to be really patient throughout the process. So I, I think, uh, you know, I, I really, I had a brief stint where I didn't have sprinting in in my training. And it was probably only, uh, during a few years where I was in New York City, you know, because there's nowhere to really sprint. Like, where do you open up here? I didn't know about the East River Park track for a while. Um, so, but prior to that, you know, in high school, I, I played sprint heavy sports with football and baseball. Uh, college, I played baseball. In mixed martial arts, our, our, my coach, he had us out on the track in the morning. You know, we, we, we did a lot of running. You know, we did we did a good amount of endurance running in terms of like uh, the most common run that we would do would be running two miles around the track, but interspersing each lap with going up and down every uh, part of the bleachers that had the bolts in it, which is much more than two miles, you know, uh, of activity. But we did run sprints, you know what I mean? Like he had us run hundreds. Um, and when I, you know, started in strength and conditioning, I was still very sprint heavy um yeah, i think like uh i'm trying to think like there i'm more thinking along the lines of when i didn't sprint i didn't sprint too much as a grad student at springfield college i was just getting huge you know i was like doing uh my the most of my workouts were um five sets of three with with um hang hang snatch and then uh three sets of 10 with back squat like that was that was my staple for a workout um, and, and it worked really well. I bench pressed and I, I, that was the workout. That was my program was, was five sets of three of snatch, uh, three sets of 10, um, bench press and three sets of 10 back squat. And I got really strong and moved a ton of barbell weight and I put on a lot of body mass. Then I going from Springfield, I ended up at Brooklyn college first and I, as soon as I was able to train down there, I mean, I, it was a very similar to like a boil esque program. Um, I put my own spin on it, but we had a terrible field in the back of that of facility, like the worst turf field that anyone has ever seen 
in the world. Like that old, the old Philadelphia, you're pretty much just running on pavement. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a little softer than something like that, but it was like peeling away. It like, I remember it was so hot back there. This was a time where a lot of people were wearing the Vibram five finger shoes and you couldn't wear those because it was so hot. It would actually cook through the bottom of them. Like there was one kid's shoes that were melting on this turf. Uh, so, but we, we ran then. When I got back to Springfield, um, you know, I was doing a lot of, of running. Um, I always made Iron Sports run. We did a ton of, of sprint work. Uh, I was like, boys, you are, you're not just lifters. You are athletes. Like, you are athletes first and you are strongman second. Like, if you want this to be sustained and long lasting, we're going to train like athletes. And then you're going to specialize in events. So <clears throat> when I got down to New York, I was doing, uh, we had some, some cool treadmills at peak. So I was able to do some elements of that. Um, so I, I feel like for me, for most of the time that I've been since, let me think that this goes back to, uh, being 20, 19 years old in 1999 up until now. So that's what almost 20, 25, 23 years now, 23 years. Um, there's, there's been, I would say for 90% of that time, some high velocity running mixed in. So it never really got away. And, and to me, that is a big, big key. And, and cause I'll tell you like when my biggest limiter is an athlete, like I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I could throw really well. I could hit really well. I understood the game at a very high level. I, my fastest 40 time was a four nine and I was an outfielder. So I just wasn't fast enough to progress through the levels. And, but I'm obsessive and I'll do anything I have to, to try to move and level up. So, you know, I, I, I was reading anything I could get my hands on as a high school kid in the mid nineties. There wasn't a lot of information, but I was trying to learn and develop anything I could on sprinting. Um, so it's always been something that I've considered as probably the most important variable in terms of the separator of athletes. And I think, you know, I, I watched football as a child. You know what I mean? Like when I was with my grandfather, um, you know, we did, I didn't watch cartoons. You know what I mean? He wasn't going to like, he was born in 1914 and like had to work the docks in South Boston as a kid. He didn't get cartoons. He wasn't going to let me watch cartoons. We watched old NFL highlight videos together when I got home after school. You know, I mean, like I can remember watching like the Purple People Eaters and Fran Tarkenton, you know, with the NFL voice. Those are back in the days when there were no rules on like hands to the face. So there's like the D is just they literally just wrapped like two inches of tape around their fist. They just came off the line throwing haymakers. Those those old videos are brutal. Yeah, man. It'd be like uh, the Minister of Defense, Deacon Jones, like just absolutely like like ringing people's bells and like clotheslining dudes on tackles. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, that was – but, you know, I, and I watched – like my Saturdays, I didn't watch cartoons as a nine-year-old or eight-year-old or seven-year-old. I was watching like college football and – all you'd ever – like, it's funny. They don't talk as much numbers-wise anymore as the announcers did back in the day where they would always be, like, highlighting the guy's 40-time and vertical jump. Like, every receiver, every back, and they're talking about their professional prospects. And, like, it was just like, yeah, this guy's uh, – his 40-time is a 4'6". He's probably not going to cut it. So it was like, as a kid, I'm like, what are all these numbers and times and this, that? But I, I always loved speed. Like, I, I think that – I mean, the neighborhood I grew up in, um, you know, we were always racing each other. Like, there was always some contest of some kind. Racing was often a, a big one. So it's – I don't I don't know if I've ever I, – I never wasn't interested in it. I've always tried to keep it in play. Uh, I think I've had a pretty good awareness of just, like, the real legitimacy and importance of it as it pertains to – uh, who's probably going to play at higher levels of sports. So it's not like it's anything new. And it's funny, like that's something I've kind of been reflecting on 
um, with my own self is I never abandoned the training components in my own life. Like I feel like sometimes people will learn some new stuff and they'll like be like, well, I shouldn't lift because I better only breathe or something like that. And it's like, I, you know, even at the peak of me going down things like the PRI rabbit hole, I was still competing in strongman. And it's like, well, I'm not going to like, you know, hip lift my way towards, uh, you know, finishing this deadlift medley at, at the national championships. Like that's not going to cut it. Like there's specificity. And so I have this long history of like actually training. And then I think a good enough academic background of being skeptical, skeptical and having a level of scrutiny and understanding specificity and all, all of those things. But it was a nice um, kind of return to focus on running a couple years ago in the beginning of the pandemic uh, when Derek came out with his like virtual summer speed program. I think I, I can't, I always say it wrong, but like it was, um, it was something where it was a good group of us going down to the track and it was, it was vicious for me. It was really vicious because it started off with five days a week of running. And at the time I was 220 pounds and I really hadn't done that kind of volume of running specific to the kinds of running that we were doing. It, it really like, first of all, I went into it injured, you know, like I, I had partially torn my left adductor running uh, on the true form treadmill um, probably maybe like six, six, eight weeks before starting this program. And as soon as I went outside and tried to run, it was like I probably re-injured it and it was a big problem. I tried to do things that were just vertical, amp vertical like direction of movement. So a lot of like A runs and B runs as opposed to focusing on running forward but I didn't want to change any of the volume for yardage that anyone else was running. So I tried to do the same number of runs for the same number of yards, but I would just A run it. And that led to like probably a hundred times more foot contacts than anybody else was getting. And within like eight to 10 weeks, I had bilateral stress fractures in both tibia and, um, and it eventually shut me down about 10 weeks in. I kept running through the stress fractures, but it started to get to the point where I would do a run. I would, my legs would puff up to like, you know, being like an inch hanging over the sock line and I wouldn't be able to support my body weight and I'd just like fall over. I was like swallowing like 25 Advil a day um, just to try to push myself through these runs. But at one point, I, I went to try to push off and start on a sprint, and I couldn't, and I just fell on my face, and I just realized, like, I'm done. Like, I, I literally, I can't do this. And um, so it was, it was, uh, I took it personal, and I really set myself on this trajectory of, like, you know what, I'm going to go back to the drawing board, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to... Um, you know, take some time and let my tibia heal. But once I'm healed, I'm going to really begin prep work so that next summer I'm going to handle the same program and I'm going to get through it. And that's really what I did. And I kind of, I, I developed more in the way of aerobic capacity. I lost weight. I did a lot of low amplitude plyometrics to be able to develop the, you know, the local endurance at the, at the tissues of the feet and the Achilles and the shin and just everything. And, um, and I built the volume up a little bit more progressively rather than starting at five days a week, starting at two days a week. And so it was a, a lot of lessons to learn. And it, I think it really paid off, you know, by this past fall of finishing up a 20 week running focus block, you know, Derek came to the city, worked with a, a group of us for a day and taught a seminar in Manhattan. And I remember I felt really good because he gave me the compliment of like, wow, you really know what you're doing. Like he, he said, I would have no problem sending anyone to work with you and have you coach them on running. And I was like, this guy doesn't blow smoke up anybody's ass. And 
you know, I, I think that it feels like I really did put time into really learning this, both from a theoretical perspective of like reading all the Charlie Francis information, studying as much as I could on uh, biomechanics of, of locomotion and applying it in my own training. And it's if this guy is saying that, that's that's meaningful. I think I think a couple of, of just big nuggets that I want to highlight for people that I think came out towards the end, which is when you kind of went back to the drawing board to figure out, okay, how can I actually get myself in a position to be ready to handle this? Because that's, I think the biggest mistake people make is they just think about themselves being 16 again. And they're like, well, I was 16. Like I never warmed up. Like I would just roll right out of the car and like, all right, here we go. Full speed. And there were no issues. But then, you know, you kind of take that stuff out. Or you're not seeing it as often. And then you kind of go right back to that world. You're kind of asking for trouble. And so a couple of things that you mentioned in that ramp up period to prepare yourself to then be able to sprint, I think was really important. It's the development of some aerobic capacity, those lower intensity plyometric drills so we can get the tissues ready. Obviously kind of like losing a little weight coming down is just going to decrease the amount of, you know, essentially force we're dealing with at ground at impact. Um, And then I think that ramp up of volume over time, right? And so... I'm wondering if you have some examples. Actually, I don't want to go there because that's going to be boring. Um, but I think like those four are really big with regards to how we're going to get somebody ready. And I think, what would you say? Like four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks? Like what did that ramp up period look like for you from a timing standpoint? Sure. I, look, I would say the biggest piece of it too was losing weight. Okay. Like I'm five six. If I'm 220, I cannot handle much running volume. Like something's going to break down. It's probably going to be my feet, but it could be shins. It could be my knee. And, you know, I'm, all, I'm also 42 years old, so it's like it just presents itself more quickly. Like whatever the problem is, it's, it's more – I'm more sensitive to it. I'm more whatever. So it's, it's very apparent to me. Whereas by the end, you know, I even even last summer, I started uh, somewhere around 220. You know, I had finished a hypertrophy block before, uh, you know, around April. And I, I know last April I was 220. And by October, I was 194. And that, that kind of, you know, 20, 26 pound weight loss, like, I, you know, I was able to handle running five days a week in October and with a a tremendous amount of volume and and yeah, like, like it is all the other pieces too. Don't get me wrong. It's all of the volume progressively added and the tolerance to it and, um, you know, following a plan and, and, but I really would say that if I was to bet on what the most important variable was for me. It was the body weight, you know, even in track, there's a classic like fat don't fly statement. Um, You know, if you're carrying around body fat, it's just extra weight. But even if you're like just heavily muscled, like you're going to take up absolute beating. Um, I know Hunter Charneski, who has been a huge inspiration to me on this. Like I remember when he just decided like, look, man, I'm going to like drop powerlifting and I'm going to let Derek coach me, and I'm going to become a competitive sprinter. Like, I'm going to live this dream. And I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen anybody do because it was it was like, you know, 280 or something like that, powerlifting. Um, and he was just like, I'm going full bore into this sprint life thing. And I know he was having terrible tissue problems at certain points, like Achilles, feet, ankle, like – and, and I think that's just what happens. If you're a big boy, like, I don't care. Like, he wasn't, like, tr- excessively fat. I mean, he was a monster. Um, you're you're going to have to be very careful about the volume. Whereas, like, the lighter people I was running with, that even if they weren't in, like, great shape, they didn't have any problems. You know, if like, people were running around 150 pounds to 160 pounds, Doom! They they had literally no problems with the volume. They were like, "This really isn't that bad." What's your what's your deal, man? I'm like, "Well, I weigh sixty pounds more than you. I weigh seventy pounds more than you. And every time I hit the ground, that's that's coming down on on one foot." 
So if, if I, I would say, I, I really think that it, it will highlight your body composition. And if the healthier the body composition is for you, and I really do mean that from a health perspective, probably the more likely you are to be able to handle pretty good amount of, of running volume. I, I like, you know, I think before we started recording, we were talking about Aaron Davis using it as a uh, kind of a screening tool uh, of sorts. And, and I think that I appreciate that. Like I, I think when I think of the greatest screening tool ever made, it's probably the blood pressure cuff. Um, that's a really good screen. And I, I would bet you that your ability to handle running volume at pretty good intensities would probably correlate very nicely with a blood pressure cuff. You know, uh, if you can follow a real track program, your health markers are probably in a really good place. Yeah, I totally agree. It's interesting because sprinting obviously has a large performance component to it. But I think as, a, as an assessment or a screen or as a diagnostic, I think it's becoming a more and more interesting tool for me when I look at people because it's like, if I have someone who can come on board that can open up and flat out sprint and can do a sprint workout, can manage not even crazy volumes, but decent volumes. It's like, that tells me a lot about your resilience and the biomechanics and the anatomy and the physiology of that organism. Um, like they, they just tend to be in a much better place from a longevity standpoint than people that cannot do those things. Right. And I'm not saying that, you need to be able to go and run like a four or five or be a competitive sprinter. It's really just, can you actually open up and sprint? Okay, great. You can sprint in a straight line. What happens if I have you try to like take a curve or do like a little bit of like a slalom run? It's like, I don't know if there's like a better diagnostic assessment tool than having people go through those and saying, okay, cool. You handle these things pretty well. Like sweet. Like, let's just go have some fun. Like there's not that much we really have to worry about here. Cornering is a very interesting uh, challenge, you know, like, yeah, I, I would say overall, there's a, there's a couple things that I feel like are very good snapshot representations of where someone's at, uh, overall. Like, uh, I think a rotational med ball throw is one of the best tools you could ever use for evaluation purposes with like, how coachable is this person? Like what's their ceiling? You know, um, if someone absolutely just like gets into their hip and blasts a med ball into a wall, I mean, that, that's, a, that's somebody that you're like, okay, I can do something with this person. Most people don't do that. It's like you, you get these funky kind of like hips don't move, like weird top-heavy kinds of. This is a two-by-four. This is like I'm just watching a two-by-four, and it's all trying to like rotate at the same time. There's no separation. <laughs> it's, it's just like I'm like, oh, God, like what is this? Like uh, you've never done anything athletic in your life, and it's just something. And anyways, like. I, I do think that's a great diagnostic. Like, hey, just just hammer the ball into the wall for five reps. Let me see what you got. And yeah, like if if somebody is capable of of getting up and running at a pretty good speed, you're kind of like, okay, like I see you. All right, we're, we got something here. Whereas if they can't do that, it's like, whoa, what do we got? And now I will say, the the best strength athlete I've ever coached was terrible runner. I mean, just like abysmal, where you're like. Oh my God, like what is this duck footed kind of like waddle that's like, a, 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 but, and he's special from a lifting standpoint, you know? So I always do look at these things as like yeah, a couple of, I, I can think of a few of them that have gone pretty far and you watch them run and you're like, Oh God, like you're the worst athlete I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, what is this? But there, I, I think that when it comes to competitive lifting, there's some other variables that come into play mostly your mind and like just your willingness to day after day after day, just like punch your ticket and have like an obsessive uh, tendency towards like, I will move more weight no matter what. Um, <clears throat> so there, I do think that, uh, but if we're, if we're not talking about just purely lifting at a high level competitively, it probably is a great indicator of someone's overall presentation of how athletic they are or versatile they are or, you know, how much, how many shoots can I sh send you down that you're going to be pretty good at if we decide to specify your training in that direction? 
Yeah, in total agreement. Um, I think that distinction is really important for people to understand. Like, if your goal is to just go be one of the best power lifters on the planet and you're trying to just max out three lifts, then yeah, like I don't think a sprinting diagnostic tool probably makes the most sense for you because you're going to have to create adaptations and changes that are probably inherently anti-sprinting in order to get to the point to be able to mash the type of ways that you want to mash. Similar thing for bodybuilding, right? Like if you want to take bodybuilding seriously and step on a stage, sprinting is not a great diagnostic tool because again, the things that you're going to have to do day in and day out and just kind of, you know, as you mentioned, almost show up and just slam your face against a brick wall repeatedly for a pretty long period of time and to just accept that suck. The changes you're going to have to go through from a physiological standpoint aren't going to really lend themselves to going out and, to, going out and fucking sprinting, right? But I think for people that, you know, want to be athletic, and in my mind, that's like you want to be strong, you want to be jacked, you want to be powerful, you want to be well-conditioned, you want to move well. Sprinting is a phenomenal tool just to kind of get a quick and easy gauge of like where in the world are you at, right? And it's, I think it's kind of kind of funny in this realm with sprinting because you mentioned this earlier where I feel like the normal trajectory of things for people, especially athletes and baseball players, I'm going to call baseball players in, in specific because every baseball player I know deep, deep down is really just a massive meathead. And pretty much all of them go through this process of like having to do athletic training things throughout high school, college, or professionally. And then the minute they're done playing baseball, they're like, give me a hypertrophy program. I just want to get swole. I just want to get so jacked that I can't fit through doorways. And then they usually do that for like a little while. And then they come back to like, okay, so this is cool. But like, can, can you give me a little bit of that athletic stuff that I used to have? Cause I feel like a, I feel like a massive refrigerator right now. I get it. Like, I mean, I, I've oscillated with that for 30 years. Like it's, it's, uh, you know, and I'm still doing it. You know, I mean, right now I'm in a uh, week, the hell week am I at? Tw- week 20 of a 22 week hypertrophy block. And um, I can't wait to be done eating my face off and just like, bro, I did 60 sets of legs yesterday. It took three hours and 40 minutes, 60 sets of legs. Like that is like, it's crazy. Like I'm so glad I'm sitting down for this interview. Like I don't want to get up. Like I'm in trouble when I have to get off this couch. Um, So I'm like really looking forward to not lifting and to get outside and to run and like, I'm already excited about programming in these slalom runs that you were just talking about. I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. Like a nice little like curvature track. And like, I'm going to put in just extra karaoke's, I think too, just so I could actually feel myself like turn. Like, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I, right now I'm running one day a week, you know, and it's, it's like just trying to maintain the quality while I focus on trying to build as much muscle mass as I can. Um, and that to me is the, is really critical. Like it hasn't gone away and I ran outside all winter in New York city. You know, I missed one Monday cause I sprint on Mondays and it was eight inches of snow on the ground that day. But other than that one day, I've been at the track every other Monday. Um, and whether it was, you know, 25 degrees and it's on the damn East river too. So it's windy. So there's been some shit days out there, but otherwise, like, you know, uh, and it's been interesting because I've gained 22 pounds in 20 weeks and running once a week with basically a one pound gain of weight per week. I mean, it gets, it's a different feel as I've been doing it, you know, where it's almost like it was interesting. A couple, I I had a, 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 a weird weekend where I was like stuck in airports and planes for 36 straight hours this past weekend. So I didn't, I wasn't able to eat the way I normally do. So I lost like two and a half pounds over the weekend, even with eating like restaurant food and blah, 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 where most people would gain weight. I lost two and a half damn pounds. It felt so easy to run this on Monday. It was kind of like, whoa, before that I would go out and do the runs and I would literally get the worst pump I, out of anything all week, I would get this horrendous quad pump and glute pump that would go into my low back. And then I'd just be like, oh my God. Like that waddle, that like post sprint waddle is so real, dude. I just like, I have vivid memories of that. And it still, it still creeps in from time to time. Um, I swear though, I was bouncing off the pump a couple of these weeks 
Like, and, like it was, and, and Tyler, who I go out and run with, is saying the same thing because he's had a pretty good block for himself too. I think he's gained like 12 or 15 pounds or something like that. And there was one day when we were both out there and it was like, do you feel like you're hydroplaning off of your pump? And it was like, yeah, like I, it's the weirdest feeling in the world. Like, um, so it's, it's like, I would say like the, and the, like the body weight, it, it just, is so incredible because it's not like I'm, I'm doing enough training where my aerobic system is pretty good. And like, if I ride a bike for tempos, it's not a problem. Like my aerobics is good, but if I have to move my own damn body through space right now, it's just like, oh shit, like this is, this is crazy. Um, and, and I've continued with it. It's not like I've just let it die, but trying to keep up with body composition changes, I, I really have a, a different appreciation of how impactful that is on run and track training. I really can't, I, I would have to highlight that as probably the most important variable uh, of, of what will cause uh, different sorts of responses. I think the body weight thing is really interesting. It just makes it so impressive when you think about the size of some of the guys in the NFL and the velocities they move at. I just, I just don't know if people actually have an appreciation for how absurd it is when I take someone who's 250 pounds and runs a four or five. Or like you take like an athletic middle linebacker that's walking around probably 245, 250 who can go sideline to sideline and really sprint. It is, it's astounding. Like the force and just like the force capacity of these people and the power is mind blowing. Cause like they're not a track athlete, right? Like you're mentioning where you can afford to essentially get as lean or as low weight as you can so that you're ready to fly. That like guys in the NFL are in a contact sport or even like rugby is another good example. You've got to have that mask because you need the body armor. But then you watch them open up and it's like, oh my God, like you are so fast. I was watching Sports Center yesterday and they had, you know, all of the pre draft coverage and they had Cam Jordan on there, who's a DN for the New Orleans Saints. And they were they were highlighting it because at a previous um, or at, at this year's combine, uh, one of the guys that was a DN didn't have his shoes, so Cam gave him his own sneakers that he was wearing and was doing the interview with no shoes on. So they were kind of showing that, but they they also showed a clip of him beating Tyreek Hill to the edge and making a shoestring tackle on him. So I mean, he's a D end. He probably weighs two seventy and like managed to like his maneuverability was incredible to you think about Tyreek Hill. I mean, that's just like such a different athletic specimen, but this dude like covered solid 15 and 20 yards, got to the edge, clipped his shoelace. And it was just like, Oh my God, that is astounding. Cause yeah, I think that there's like an appreciation of, uh, you know, when, when you get somebody that's little, like a, a, a tiny athlete, it's 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 different. Like when you have someone that large that's moving themselves through space like that, that is the different. That is professional athletics. You know what I mean? That's the when any sport seems to mature, that's how you know it's kind of mature. You know, I mean, look at the, there's one Jose Altuve in Major League Baseball. You know, and, and it's funny when you see him standing on second base next to the other guys and he looks like their child. Yeah, it's like, did he like take him out of his backpack and like put him down? Like, is that his, like, his toy? Like, what, what is going on here? But most of, like, across the major sports, hockey, baseball, football, obviously basketball is different verticality. But <clears throat> when you when you look at these athletes that are, projecting things through space at high velocities and projecting themselves through space at high velocities. And ultimately they like the larger athletes are the ones that dominate in those things. Eventually as the sport just reaches these, these peak levels of selection from enough of the population. So it does seem to be the difference maker when you really get down to it. Like, are you a huge person that can handle 
projecting themselves through space at a high velocity or projecting another object through space at a high velocity. But the ability to handle the competition volume and the training volume is, is what it probably will come down to from an injury prevention standpoint. And again, I, I think, you know, so many people overblow the, the biomechanics side of it. It's a, it's a factor, don't get me wrong. You have to move good enough for your sport, with, which most athletes probably can do. But then it, it really will come down to, to training load and trying to progress athletes up to the point where they're like able to handle. Uh, but, you know, again, it's kind of like an appreciation for how large the athletes are for the impact that comes from every foot contact. It's just exponentially greater compared to a smaller athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Without question. It's like, I, I've said this multiple times on the podcast that I think that we can pretty, I think simply sum up athleticism as your area under the force velocity curve, the athlete with the greatest area under the force velocity curve, 99 times out of a hundred will probably be the better athlete, right? Like if we wanted a very simple, just like graphic illustration of that in our mind, I'm like the farther out we push that curve, the greater the area under that curve, the better the athlete's going to be. Because at the end of the day, athleticism at the highest levels almost always comes down to velocity. Velocity becomes the biggest differentiator at every single level as you move up, right? You can look at it in terms of actual speed on the ground. In baseball, we can look at velocity. We can look at bat speed. Velocity is like the, the differentiator between athletes. And, you know, and one of the things that we want to do one of the things that you're doing with athletic weapon, one of the things we're trying to do at rebel is we want to help these people that have been athletes their entire life, not just totally let go of that. Like keep training like an athlete, keep making sure that you can bring velocity to the table because that's going to pay itself dividends long term. Um, you know, hopefully at some point in time we can give these people an athletic outlet per se so that we can reward them for still being able to sprint and move fast because normal day to day life doesn't really give them that anymore. It's like you can go power lift or bodybuild or Olympic lift or CrossFit. And it's like, well, you're not really being rewarded for the time spent on the track or sprinting or doing those things. So hopefully we can bring something to the world that's going to actually give people a competitive outlet in this realm so they can get back to enjoying. Exactly. I've thought about that. I've thought about that. Just basically, I'm going to say this now on the podcast and someone's going to totally steal this idea and it's going to infuriate me. But one of the things I really want to do is to create a, a sport that gives strength conditioning training, like good strength conditioning. It's pretty much like the sport of strength conditioning. Let's give strength conditioning a competitive outlet for people, right? You can call it the combine, whatever you want, but like, yeah, like we're going to mash some weights. You're going to need to be strong. You're going to need to have hypertrophy. You're going to need to be able to sprint and throw stuff. You're going to need to have some endurance, like a true test of athleticism for people that want to continue to train like an athlete throughout life. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've had this same thought for a long time as well. You know, like um, all of the relevant tasks so that it's not like CrossFit is too. It's the same thing over and over again. It's, it's just the Olympic lifting gymnastics, gymnastics sport, right? Yeah, it's like you got to do really high rep Olympic lifts and you got to do really high rep gymnastics. It's not to say it's not impressive. Someone's going to listen to this and be like, oh, you asshole. I'm like, don't get me wrong. Like the people that compete at the CrossFit games are absolute savages. I just don't have any interest in, in like that. Yeah. I have no interest. The movements, the movements themselves are like non-desirable movements from the perspective of your like orthopedic health. You know what I mean? Like if you really want surgery, by all means, like just go down that road. But like, it also isn't the truest test of expression of your physiology. There's, like too much of a skill component and like a anthropometry component. You know, if you like, if you really want to be good at Olympic lifts, you kind of have like a, you have to have a certain anthropometry. Like everything does. I get it. You know what I mean? If you want to be good at rowing, you better be built like Kyle Dobbs. Like I'm not going to ever compete with him in, in, on a rower. Like, but if there's enough of a, like, I, I just think like, the, what is the purest expression of a, of a type of fitness? You know, like, Olympic lifts aren't really the purest expression of any kind of fitness necessarily. They're a measure of how good you are at Olympic lifts and you probably have to be pretty strong in order to do that with some snap and some power to you. But like 
Sprinting is a much better indicator regarding your overall levels of uh, high rate of force development and elasticity, okay? Uh, stretch shortening cycle activity, like that needs to be, high velocity running would need to be in this thing. Like jumping is uh, like a, jumping is probably a better indicator of whatever the fitness quality is than Olympic lifting. Because there's less of a skill element to it and a technical element, like technique and skill and all that stuff. It's just raw performance. Yeah. That's really what I want to see. It's like, I want to see people that have to lift, you know, singles, triples, maybe five rep maxes. Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy gets a little bit trickier. That's a harder one to test. But I think on the average, if we start putting people into higher rep ranges or give them time sets, I think that the person that has better hypertrophy, like if we take like a Ryan the Cure, for example, on average, he's going to win higher rep or time sets more often than not. I bet that you're going to have a correlation there. Power, keep it fucking simple. I want to see you sprint. I want to see you jump. And I want to see you throw stuff. Just pure output. And then like endurance, same thing. Like let's put you on a salt bike for 10 minutes and see what you can crank out. Like the best that we've seen to date still on a 10 minute echo bike all out is five miles in 10 minutes, which was, oh, it's stupid. It's bananas. If anybody wants to give it a go, go for it. But yeah, five miles is the number, the best number I've had someone put down. And I'm just like, you look at what he's averaging, what he's averaging. Oh, it's sickening. It's sickening. But yeah. What's that? 500 watts? Yeah. Cause I did the four miles on the, uh, assault bike in 10 minutes and it hit, 4.0 as the timer went 959 like clicking I was, it like was exactly and I it took me weeks to hit the four miles on that thing you know Vinny got 4.4 four. um I think liqueur was right in that same zone but oh I that's just bringing back nightmares as soon as I hit that 4.0 I never did it again um five oh is gross I had to average I had to hold it over 400 watts for the whole 10 minutes like it's it's crazy. I think it spits it spits a little bit higher wattage, or it, it like ticks over distance a little faster, which is weird with all of those bikes. They're all a little bit their own thing, you know. They have their quirks. But yeah, no, that's that's one of the things that I want to see. Like, I would I would love to see a competition where we. I don't want to remove all skill because there's always going to be like sprinting is is a skill. There's all the skill component to it, but I kind of just want to see like the rawest expression of just strength and hypertrophy and power and endurance and be like, just show it to me. Like, I'm not going to handcuff you with something super highly technical, like an Olympic lift. I'm not going to have you swinging on pull-up bars. Like, let's just let it eat and see what we got. Cause I think that it would be really impressive if you gave people that as a destination to train for. That was one of the things I really wanted to do with the strength score stuff, you know? I had the one competition and it was cool, you know, like it really just measured what is your actual work output, you know? And so I, I do think that, that having something in that vein is really important because I do think that when you look at the weight room, oftentimes what you'll see is that the people that, that are most dominant in the weight room probably will sit on the bench in your field sports and, you know, because I think that I think you and I, we just come from athletic backgrounds, playing like actual sports. And you're always trying to figure out in those instances, why is this person so dominant? You know what I mean? Like what what is it that separates them? Is there this, you know, physical quality that is the, the great separator? Uh, and, and it's hard to figure out sometimes, you know, like. I can remember uh, the, like a local kid from my area that was like the best soccer player. Kid just scored a million goals, but like he didn't do anything particularly well. If you were to measure him, like he wasn't that fast. He was like he, but he had some like weird sixth sense of where to be and how to just put the ball in the net. And it was like, I don't get it. Like this, this is the guy. Like this is this dude. Like, and then you watch him play and he scores three goals and you're like how the hell did he do it again? Like he just always does it. So there's, there's some things where you're like, it doesn't make any sense. And then other times where you see like, you know, Calvin Johnson out there and it's like, you know, th and that's the stuff where you're like, now that's an athlete. 
Dude out jumped. He out jumped the Vertigax on his pro day at Georgia Tech. They put it. They maxed it out. His first jump, he hit everything, and they were just like, I think it was like forty, and they put just put a plus for his vertical because like we don't know what it goes to, so just a little plus on the end. Heard all the all the crazy legendary stuff about him. Like his three hundred yard shuttles were just like the most absurd. Thing. He just did like fifty and fifty with a two minute rest in between them. Could you imagine if he ever had a good quarterback and he didn't have to waste his career in Detroit? If you had, had if you, I was like, can I just give him one year for the love of God, just put him in New England for one year with Tom Brady and we'll break every single record on the books. Yeah, prime, prime Megatron in that, like, because it wasn't prime Randy Moss, which is crazy, you know, like, yeah, we don't really know how good Megatron would have been. Because you're literally putting him on the worst franchise in North American sports history. <laughs> oh my God, that's so true. That's so true. Is there a worse franchise in the history of North American sports than the Detroit Lions? Oh, that'd be a tough one. It's a tough question. The Jaguars haven't been around long enough to take that crown. They're on a good trajectory, but... Yeah, I mean, the Cubs have redeemed themselves over the last decade. Maybe if you go back to the early 2000s when the Cubs had gone so long without ever actually winning anything. It's like you had people that were born a Cubs fan and died a Cubs fan and never saw them win. Maybe the Cubs at some point in time, maybe like the Browns can make a run for that at some point, but they're competitive again now. They're back. And the Browns were good when I was a kid, man. I remember those like Elway playoff games against Cleveland, like Bernie Kosar, like like just a great head of hair. Yeah, I just actually that's a good point. I don't know if I can ever think of a time in my life that I was like the Detroit Lions are are a legitimate competitor. No, they had the greatest running back in the history of the sport, and they couldn't get out of the first round of the playoffs. I mean, they just stink. They've like. I think my I can remember my grandfather talking about the Lions when he was a kid, and um, you know I think they were good for a minute, but like they haven't been good since like the nineteen tens or something like that. I mean it's it's a yeah, and I still don't think they won any championships because they probably still would have lost to like the you know the Giants or somebody like that. Like no, they're they're the worst. This is one of the things that drives me insane. They do this every year in college football, and it blows my mind. They always, they always put up like the ten greatest college football teams of all time, and in the top five, without fail, they always have a couple of teams from like Notre Dame or some school like that from like the 1920s or the 1930s. I'm like, that team would not win a game today. Like it would be, it would be laughable. Like every every team Alabama has put on the field for the past decade is orders of magnitude better than that team. Like, they had no athletes. Yeah, Norm, Norm Van Brockland is going to get his job broken in, in the first in the first play of the game. You know, like... The average weight of the line was probably, like, 225 pounds. <laughs> they probably ran five twos. Like... Yeah, yeah like, this, this wing tee is going to just <laughs> absolutely get teed up. Like... You, <laughs> Oh, I love it. But on the, on the athlete front, because we're at like 53 minutes here, so we'll wrap this up. One thing that we're working on, and I may send this your way for a little bit of feedback, we're trying to, you know, like in high school or in college weight rooms, a lot of times you'll see you have this like levels game for people. Like we were the chargers in high school. And so in our weight room, we had charger, iron charger, super charger. And I was like, you had to be able to squat this, bench this, power clean this, 40 this, shuttle this. And if you did those metrics, then you were basically like crowned, charger iron charger or supercharger and just and it kind of leveled your way up as you went one of the things we're working on right now is trying to create a similar classification system for our people and basically have human these are the that's a bare necessities of what we think a human needs to be able to do across strength hypertrophy power endurance human human plus life proof total package and then just apex um just to give people some numbers and things to actually shoot for because i think that's one of the hardest parts for people that want to keep training to be an athlete that want more of a strength conditioning feel is they don't really like what are they doing it for like they don't have objective numbers like you would when you compete for powerlifting. well i love that yeah i mean that sounds great like i'm all charged up now no pun intended but uh 
yeah, I mean, like, I'm like, throw down some numbers. I want to come smash them, you know? Like, give me something to chase here. Because, I mean, it's funny. Like, even with, like, the hypertrophy training, like, I set a goal for myself. It was, like, 22 pounds in 22 weeks. Okay? And it's like, I did that. And it's like, all right, cool. Like, you know, whatever. Um, but when it's when it's more anything that I can make objective and chase, I love that. Like, if you can give me a number and I can, like, try to strategize a game plan and go get that number, like, I, I'm going to love that, you know? And I just, I'm thinking to myself while you're telling the story, I'm like, man, I wish they had stuff like that when I was in high school. That would have been amazing. We didn't even have a weight room in my high school. Uh, you know, so it's, it's like, it's a lot of things are timing in life. You know, timing is so critical. Like for me at the time that I came up, there was nothing like, I mean, all the coaches I had in high school were just like, do not lift. That's how you make yourself muscle bound. And if you muscle bound, you'd be a terrible athlete. Okay. Uh, that was it. It was just this certainty of becoming muscle bound. That was the term. Babe Ruth didn't lift. Babe Ruth never lifted a weight. <laughs> I've heard that one thrown around before. No. Well, that his, his bat was a weight. The guy swung a 56 ounce bat. Yeah. That's because that's how I very clearly know that anybody in professional baseball at that time didn't throw harder than 80 miles an hour. Because there's no chance. I'm just like they're they're essentially like you're they're they're pitching like a high school like a below average high school pitcher nowadays. Now that being said, have you seen the documentary Fastball? I have watched that, and that is fascinating. Like you have some outliers like that that were very impressive back in the day. Yeah, I mean, because they they sort of like were were saying that Walter Johnson, um, he was probably throwing at least in the upper nineties. You know, and he was the like he had some equivalent guys at that time too, like a Cy Young and other people. And and it's a different ball. You know what I mean? They're probably throwing a damn ball of yarn at you out there. Um, it is interesting though, like because I do follow uh, baseball like accounts on social media. Like those are some of my favorites because like uh, how much technology they use now and like how different they coach compared to when I was a kid. Like I was in this era of like uh, A to C through B was the only thing that they gave you from a coaching perspective on how to swing. There were no launch angles. It was down through the ball, create backspin. Um, you know, now it's like, that's laughable. It's kind of like, well, how much, you know, bat head can we keep in the zone for as long as possible to create a launch angle on the ball? Um, and I know that like, the, the primary swings they use from a teaching perspective, Barry Bonds' swing is, like, perfect. But the only other swing that looks like Barry Bonds' swing in the history of the sport is Babe Ruth in terms of the way that those two athletes turned. Um, and so it is kind of like that's it. You got those two guys that swing the bat differently than everyone who has ever played the game. And you have, like, uh, Ted Williams and Ken Griffey. It seems to be all these lefties for whatever reason um, that have this very long time of bad head spent in the in the in like the contact zone. But it's the it's something about the way that those athletes turned and sequenced their turn for being able to create that um, that they try to teach now at, at a very high level. So. But the other thing is just that, like, it doesn't seem – like, we talk – this has been a lot on velocity, which I really like because, again, like, I just feel like it's underappreciated in fitness. And, like, I've been in New York City and it's, like, it's not a it's not a sport performance place. New York City is not sport performance. It just isn't. Like, you just have uh, people training for aesthetics and you got clown stuff in New York City, you know. Um, and – but when you really get down to sports development, it's velocity stuff. It really – it will always come back to that. But, you know, the velocity at which people can do things like baseball movements, I don't, it hasn't really changed that much over time, you know. Like at least that documentary really pointed it out to me. And I, I feel like I, I, that was something that I think probably knew anyways. But Bob Feller throws harder than anyone playing current Major League Baseball. Nolan Ryan threw harder than anyone playing current Major League Baseball. 
Uh, highly likely, Walter Johnson might have been throwing harder than anyone playing in current Major League Baseball. Based on the analysis of, like, even radar gun information, Bob Feller got to throw, like, two pitches with a radar gun. And one of them beat a motorcycle, and they clocked it 90 feet away from his release point, and it was still going 91 miles an hour. Um, and if they measured him at hand release, it would have been going at 107 miles an hour. You know, they measure every current Major League Baseball pitcher at hand release. Nolan Ryan would have been hitting 108, 109 based on picking it up as it was crossing home plate with the radar guns in the 80s. And he was still pumping 98, 99. You know, like, and, and if you watch his highlights, it's like you literally see smoke coming out of that catcher. It's insane. And you look at the right fielders of the 70s, and the cannons from the outfield, it's, like, different. There, there's, like, maybe Mike Trout throwing the way that those guys did. But it's different, man. Like, the arms back then are incredible. Absolute cannons. Uh, you look at Andre Dawson from shortstop throwing absolute scud missiles from, like, deep in the hole across the diamond, popping the first baseman's mitt. Like, you literally see, like, dirt and the, the friggin' uh the net of the glove like just almost busting out the back end i mean the hawk had to have been throwing 100 miles an hour from shortstop like the the cannons across the history of the sport nobody's throwing harder today despite all the training and the technology and all that kind of stuff you know so i'm i'm fascinated in that kind of stuff I mean, people will say that Jesse Owens was faster than anybody currently it's just that his surface was different. His shoes were different. Yeah. It's interesting because it, what it really feels like, because we actually went up and watched a ball game at the University of Tennessee here a couple weeks ago, and they're on fire right now. They're the number one college baseball team in the country. I think they actually just lost last night, which brings them to like 32-2. and two. Um, it's, it's like the very top end capacity of what humans can do hasn't really changed. It's just the percentage of people that are now getting up into that threshold that's changed. Like, here's an example. We went and watched University of Tennessee. Their starter, who is like an 18-year-old kid, sitting 97, the first kid they bring out of the bullpen, 102. And it's like, that's where you have to be now to be competitive at high-level college baseball. Like, I was playing D1 ball 10 years ago, and once a year – a couple times a year, you'd come across like a horse that was 95 plus. Now it's like, you're not competitive unless you've got three weekend starters that are 95 plus and you got guys coming out of the bullpen at 98 plus. It's just like, we've kind of cracked the code and how to generate this velocity. And it's like the top end hasn't changed much, but we have way more people now operating towards that top end. That's fascinating. I love what you just said there. That makes a ton of sense to me. And, and I think you see it with, if you look at the way that you have these private facilities that are training baseball athletes, you know, they have all these tools that they use now. The, the, that's, have you seen that thing where they, uh, like the front foot on a pitcher, they have this thing, the slide, and they literally just have it slide down this little metal ramp, and it just puts you in exactly the right position at the end of your, like, uh, that step to get into, into the cocking phase of throwing. It's fascinating, but they, it's, I, I feel like, you're right. It's almost like we've decoded the positions and the mechanics that the highest end people ever used. And now we understand how to put other people into those places to give them the opportunity to, to really utilize um, the ability to hit those things. And then you measure it with an immediate biofeedback and like, that's inc I, I love the analysis that you just kind of rocked my brain there. I, I, I appreciate that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's end there. I'll always want to end on a high note. So I'll end on a rocking of the brain sensation. Pat, man, this has been fantastic. Always enjoy getting to catch up with you. I feel like we could just sit here and shoot the shit and just talk sports and training and we didn't even talk about food or anything else this whole time. But, um, thanks so much for coming on, man. Where can people go to, to find you, to find out more about what you got going on? I think everything's on Instagram for the most part for me. Um, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't even operate my own Instagram anymore. Like, I, uh, I try to be totally hands-off with that stuff. Um, I, I think that there's a, 
a website that's pr pretty close to being built out. I don't think that's done yet. Um, I, I just try to focus on the content and I try not to like pay attention to anything that's on social media or the internet or anything at this point. Um, you know, if, if I do, it's literally like baseball or golf, uh, coach sites and stuff like that. Like, which I just like, you know, I just, I, I like learning from skill coaches. I think skill coaches are better to learn from than, uh, fitness coaches most of the time. You know, if you're already a pretty good fitness coach, watch skill coaches, for sports, they'll, they'll, they're great coaches and they, uh, it, it'll pull you enough outside of your realm to be able to get you to think differently. But, um, you know, I, I think that everything that I have from a product standpoint can be found in the link tree on my Instagram page. So that's, that's probably where people should go for me. Beautiful. Easy. Well, thanks for tuning in everybody. Hope you guys have an amazing week and, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Talk soon.